Jesus steps out on the cloud and calls his children, the dead in Christ will rise to meet him in the air. And those of us that remain will be changed in a moment. Lord, today is another affirmation of my belief in the providence of God. The providence of God being defined as the protective care of the Lord. I think I'm more sensitive to that because I am acutely aware that uh, many of you are grieving today over uh, recent losses of loved ones in our church and even more recently, uh, Rhonda, this past week. And I know that uh, you're, you're hurting because you've lost a friend and you've, you're hurting because you've lost a co-worker and you're hurting because you've lost a classmate and all of those things. And so I'm acutely sensitive to that today. Uh, last Sunday evening, uh, as we were at home, I began pre preparation for this message. I knew basically what I was going to preach way back in August uh, when I was scheduling this series of messages. And so I knew that this would be the topic of the day. Uh, last Sunday evening, I, I began preparing this. And uh, as I was there at home, I, I began to read through that passage sitting in my recliner. And uh, I entitled this message, Comfort One Another. I did not know what the events of the week uh, would, uh, how they would unfold, uh, but I know that God in his providential wisdom knew. Uh, God is never caught off guard, and so he knew that, and he knew uh, what you needed as a church, and so uh, this morning we're going to be talking about comfort one another. I'm not uh, detracting from my series. It's, it's right on point because God knew exactly uh, where we needed to be on this particular day. Uh, there's a hymn in our hymn book that we sing from time to time. It goes something like this. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. For Christ coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Last week, we looked at the kingdom of God, and uh, our premise was this. The cure for life's worries is confidence in God's kingdom. The cure for life's worries is confidence in God's kingdom. I'm going to adjust that a little bit today. And uh, the first part of this may surprise you, uh, but I, I'm standing by my guns on this, uh, and here it is. The cure for death and fear of death is confidence in God's kingdom. Cure for death? Come on. You, you, are you serious? Yes, I am serious. The cure for death and the fear of death is confidence in God's kingdom. So the question today is simply this. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Does that bring fear in your heart? I quoted a man by the name of Pat Schreiner last week. Uh, he defined the kingdom for us, and I'm going to say that again today. Uh, the kingdom of God is this. It is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. So in light of the events of this past week and in many of your lives and families, you've recently uh, lost loved ones. Can I say this? The king's power is always and ever. It is a constant, the king's power. But let me elaborate on that definition. The king's power over the king's people. Sometimes the king's people change. Sometimes the king's people leave this earthly body and their spirit goes to heaven and their body remains here on the earth. 
But the king's power still remains. The king's people may be on earth, or the king's people may be in heaven, but the king's power remains exactly the same. I believe in the kingdom of God. It is the cure for death and the fear of death, and it is to have confidence in the kingdom. Quite frankly, the coming of Christ and all of those things is one of the most difficult doctrines that we could talk about in our series when we're talking about what we believe. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, uh, it is rather slippery to get your hands on uh, what one believes about the coming of Christ. There is many views as there are flavors of ice cream. Uh, even I and my own sons don't agree on all of the uh, intricacies of the coming of the Lord. And that is fine because it's not necessary to agree on that in order to go to heaven. But as you look at that and you look at books like Daniel and you look at books like the book of Revelation where we're going to be this morning, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, you might look at those passages and go, it's hard to understand. Is that, am I to take that literally or am I to take that symbolically when it talks about the millennial reign of Christ? Is that real? Is that literal or is that symbolic? If it is real, when is that going to occur? Uh, we know from the book of Revelation and the book of First and Second Thessalonians that there will come a time when a man is revealed by the name of Antichrist. And uh, it tells us that there's going to be seven years upon the earth where the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. And how does that fit into the equation with the Lord's coming and the, uh, the catching away, as it were, uh, which we're, is what we're going to talk about this morning. All of that is very difficult to uh, wrap your mind around in one sermon, but I'm going to do my best. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Well, uh, as we're thinking about uh, that uh, uh, letter uh, that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, it's kind of amazing in this fact, uh, unlike Ephesus where Paul labored for about five years, Paul only spent three weeks in the little town of Thessalonica. Uh, while he was there for three weeks, he reasoned at the synagogue until they had enough of him, and they, they uh, fired him and, and threw him out of the synagogue. But then he, he daily went to the hall of Tyrannus, and there he, he uh, reasoned with everybody until they got mad, and a, a big riot ensued. And they ended up, after three weeks, having to sneak Paul out of town under cover of night in order to save his life. And so Paul is writing this letter back to that group of people who he only had contact with for three weeks. Unlike the people at Ephesus where he was able to preach the whole counsel of God, he was only able to uh, speak to them for three weeks. So I'm sure he was not able to preach the whole counsel of God. And so there was a lot of confusion, and there was much confusion about the coming of the Lord. They were expecting the Lord to return at any moment, as should we. But their big question was this. What about the people that know the Lord that have died since Jesus left this earth, what of their status? When we buried them and laid them in the ground, is that where they remain? Is that where they are until the resurrection? And so there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding and there was a lot of bad information about the coming of the Lord. And so Paul writes this letter and he gives us this little section of uh, revelation in order to shed light on that. Uh, let's read it, uh, beginning with verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, 
so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by the word from the Lord, or a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and the trumpet of God. Then we who are, are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The certainty of Christ coming in the clouds should bring a comfort to us. It should bring a comfort to God's people. It's not something that should be troubling to us. It's not something that we should be fearful of. It's something that should bring us joy and that should bring us comfort. That hymn that uh, we sing that I referred to earlier, uh, it continues with this thought. Kind of speaking of what Barb talked about in her prayer as she was talking to the Lord. Well, we live in a day when, <laughs> wow, <laughs> how do you describe the day that we live in? Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. God's sending of his son in the clouds should bring us much comfort, extreme comfort. Where I'm from, lots of comfort. Exceedingly much comfort. And so, first of all, I want us to look at verse 13 where Paul is going to tell us this. We need to find comfort as you understand God's plan about His coming, Christ coming. In light of the fact that I said, or besides the fact that I said, it's a difficult doctrine to get your hands on, uh, that being said, uh, we do not need to be misinformed about it. And so Paul has three objectives as he is sharing uh, this word from the Lord. And uh, my objectives are the same as his objectives uh, this morning. Uh, his first objective is to remove all ignorance, to remove all misunderstanding, to remove all doubt about the Lord and his coming. His second objective is to give the people of God hope. His third objective is to provide comfort for the people of God. And so he begins there in verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed. Some of your translations may actually use the word ignorant. Ignorant is not a bad word. I know that sometimes... When people call you ignorant, they may use it in a derogatory way, but all ignorant says is uh, you are lacking information. And so Paul says, I am writing this to you because I do not want you to be uninformed. I do not want you to lack information. The proper information uh, 
so that it will affect you in a negative way. We don't want you to be uninformed. Look who his audience is. He's just not talking to everybody here. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to God's people. I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. Aren't you thankful for the work of Jesus? Because of the work of Jesus, because of his sacrificial death on the cross, and his vicarious atonement, and his powerful resurrection because of all of that death for the Christian is only recorded in scripture as sleep sleep it's the great enemy Paul said death is the enemy and yet here he's defining it as sleep I don't want you to be uninformed about those believers who have succumbed to death. I don't want you to I don't want you to lose any sleep over those that have went to sleep. He says so that you will not grieve. I have a loved one. <clears throat> She's uninformed. She's, she's lacking information. Uh, she believes that when a person dies, that there they remain in the ground until Jesus comes again one day. She buys into the notion of what's commonly called soul sleep. That's what she adheres to. I remember when my grandmother passed away, and I remember sitting over there with the pallbearers, and I remember being one of the young ones uh, that was a pallbearer, and I remember my loved one sitting over about there, and I remember thinking, even as a child, a young believer, because I knew what she believed, and I thought even as a child, how pitiful and how grievous that must be for you to think that your loved one laying here is going to lay here and lay here, and lay here. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We may lay this shell down, but when we lay this body down, our spirit is immediately ushered into the presence of God. When they lay me down one day, if Jesus does not come, and you come to my funeral, I assure you, the shell is there, but the nut has gone. He is in the presence of the Lord. But some are uninformed. Some misunderstand death, dying, and the Lord. He says, I don't want you to grieve like the rest. And I don't want that to come to the point where you have no hope. Listen, I have been, I have done a lot of funerals in my day. And I have been to a lot of funerals in my day. There is nothing that is more pitiful than a service for a believer where there, the audience experiences no hope and the preacher gives them none. They may be uninformed, but that's a failure on the preacher's part. He is there to offer Because death is not the end for the believer. 
<laughs> Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. And then in Titus Paul gives this admonition to the young preacher. He says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ is our blessed hope. And so as we're thinking about that coming, secondly, there in verse 14, we need to find comfort as you see the proof about the dead at Christ's coming. And so he says there in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So here's the proof. The proof is this. Jesus died, and he rose again. There's the proof. Now, you will notice that whereas death for the believer through this passage is continually, at least except for one point, it is referred to as what? Sleep. Sleep. As, as, we enter into our rest, our eternal rest as it is. But you will notice, Paul says, for if we believe that Jesus died, because Paul wants us to not forget that Jesus' death was not sleep. Jesus' death was death. Jesus died so that we could sleep. So, he says... If we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way or analogous to or equal to, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So, that little word, if, there, the condition of this sentence in the original language is this. That it's if, not in the sense of, well, you know, I just don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, no. It's, it can be translated since. Or it could be said this way. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and it's a truth, and it's a matter of fact, he said, because we believe this, we know this. See, now he's talking about this, remember. We don't know about our loved ones that have passed away in the Lord. He said, but I don't want you to grieve, and I, don't, I, I want you to have some hope, because I want you to understand this. Jesus died. And uh, through Jesus, what you're going to experience is that those, those that have died before, it's just sleep. And so when Jesus comes again, what's going to occur? It says, God will bring with him. So we'll just do a directions here. God up there, we're down here. God up there will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord because the Lord will bring those who have fallen asleep. Their body's there, but their soul is with him. And so he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Uh, actually, there's a, a parallel passage to this passage. It's a passage that you hear many times at funerals. It's John 14. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you with myself. Now, he's not talking to dead people. He's talking to living people. 
So those that have died before, he's bringing with him when he comes. But those that remain, what does he say? I'm coming for you so that you can be with me always. So find comfort in the proof about the dead at Christ's coming because the proof is Jesus died and he lives. We live too. Third, find comfort as you trust in the Lord's promise about his coming. The Lord's promise about his coming. Verse 15, Paul says, For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. Uh, what Paul is saying there is, I didn't make this up. I got this word especially from the Lord. When did he get it? I have no idea. Did he get it on the road to Damascus? Maybe. Did he get it some other time? Probably. Who knows? But the point is, it is a word from the Lord. And so because of that, we can believe that word. It is God's truth. And so here's the word that he gives. First, he talks about those that remain. Uh, he says, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not pre precede those who have fallen asleep. So when the Lord comes, uh, many loved ones will have been laid to rest. Sad but true. Some will live to see the Lord come again. I remember at an uncle's funeral one time that uh, uh, I was probably a teenager. Uh, let's see, I was 17 years old. And I remember as we would want to do, we gathered there in the living room and we're all talking as a family, you know, ideas are flying all around here. And, and I said something along the lines of, well, I'm, I, I just believe in the Lord and he's going to come again. And I remember one of my uncles saying, just as a matter of fact. Well, I suppose that you believe that you're just going to live till Jesus comes. I, I was kind of just taken off guard. Uh, I, I didn't figure that would come flying out of his mouth. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I responded kindly and I said, uh, matter of fact, I do. Uh, now I'm going to elaborate on that uh, 43 years later by saying this. Am I going to live to see Jesus come? I do know this. There's nothing left to happen that the Bible says has to happen to keep him from coming. I know this. Since he said that 43 years ago, it's 43 years closer to the coming of the Lord than it was then. Will I live to see Jesus come? I don't know. I hope I do. But if I don't, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I will come back with him, and I will meet those that are still alive on this earth. So those are the ones remaining. Now let's look at the return. Verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. Now, is that three things? Or is that, just, is that three synonymous things that describe one event? Well, the answer to that is yes. It's all of those things. That it's three things that happen simultaneous. Uh, the Lord himself will descend with a shout. The voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The return of Jesus is imminent. It is imminent. It is also instantaneous. That passage in 1 Corinthians said, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, let me just take these off. This is not a twinkling of an eye. That's a blink of an eye. The twinkling of an eye is when light refra refracts off of your eye. How long does that take? Well, it just happened. 
the Lord's coming is imminent and it will be instantaneous. His return will not hinder the dead. It makes no difference where our deceased loved ones in the Lord lay. It makes no difference where they are. Whether they were buried in ground, whether they were cremated, whether they were buried at sea, whether they died in a nuclear holocaust at Hiroshima Nagasaki, I assure you this, the Lord knows where every one of those molecules are. And he will put every one of those molecules together on that day. The dead will not be hindered. You'll notice there that the Lord's turn, uh, return is personal. It says the Lord himself. He's not sending an angel. He's not sending Moses. He's not sending Elijah. The Lord himself is coming. It is personal. He will come, and how is he coming? He will descend from heaven. It says with a shout. That's the word kalusma, which is not just a shout of any kind of shout. It's a military shout. It's uh, a call to attention, as it were. And so what's the Lord calling to attention? Well, he's calling to attention the bodies, the bodies of the dead. And when the Lord calls to attention, well, anything, it is so. One of my favorite New Testament stories is uh, found in John 11. It's the story of Jesus' friend Lazarus. You remember when Lazarus died? And, uh, you know, they had already placed the body in the ground and the Lord had delayed. And uh, uh, we're going to go see Lazarus. And the disciples said, well, Lord, you can't, you can't go now. His body already stinks. The decaying process has already began to take place. And the Lord says, uh, show me where he lays. And you know, the Lord started walking through the graveyard. And uh, he could have said a lot of things, but here's what he said. Lazarus, come forth. And you know what? Lazarus got up out of the grave because the Lord commanded him to. The Lord summoned him to. If Jesus had just said, get up out of that grave, do you realize every body in that cemetery would have got up out of that grave. But the Lord identified only one person, and so the one person obeyed the command. That's what's going to occur on that day when the Lord descends from heaven with the voice of an archangel and a shout. Truly, I tell you, John 5, anyone who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. And then he goes on in verse 28. Do not be amazed at this, because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Hmm. Well, there'll be a resurrection. He continues there in verse 16. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So there's an order of this. Jesus is coming back with those that have died and gone before, their spirits, with, with the voice of an archangel and a shout. The dead in Christ will rise first. Their body is going to meet their, their glorified body, is going to meet their soul in the clouds in heaven. There it is. The dead in Christ will rise first. First, the dead in Christ here are the same in verse 13 and 14 that are asleep in the Lord. But then he says this. He talks about an event. The Lord's coming is much like the Lord's day uh, when it's described in the Bible. The Lord's day can be one day, but then the Lord's day can be, well, years and years and years. The day of the Lord. And so... Uh, we're, we're talking here about a, the, the next thing that occurs. So the dead get a new body, meets their spirit in the clouds. Verse 17 talks about a catching away. Uh, it's the word harpazo, which means to snatch. 
Uh, the Latin word uh, is where we get the word rapture, the Vulgate translation. So he says, then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together. Those that are alive will be caught together with those that are dead in the clouds. And there'll be a great reunion because it says there, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful thing. And it should be a reassuring thing. Because verse 18 says this. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Out of all of the verses that I just read, there's only one command in this passage. Only one. One imperative. And it is what I just read. Therefore, comfort. There's the command. If we walk out of here with nothing today, we know this. We are to comfort one another with the coming of the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. As I stated earlier, many are grieving. Many are hurting. And that's to be understood. But the coming of the Lord tells us this. Death is not the end. The Lord is coming again. A dead body will be rejoined with its spirit one day with the Lord in the clouds with a new body, a glorified body. And so that is comforting. Paul concludes 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection by saying, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor is not uh, labor in the Lord is not in vain. So the certainty of Christ coming in the clouds brings comfort. I remember a song growing up. Uh, I'm going to date myself here. Uh, it was early, I mean, early contemporary Christian mu music. A uh, guy by the name of Larry Norman. And uh, he, he wrote a song, and it had a phrase in it that went like this. It described the coming of the Lord. And then there was a pause, and he said this, I wish we'd all been ready. I wish we'd all been ready. Lost person, are you ready? See, when the Lord comes to catch his bride away, to meet him in the clouds, only believers will see that. When the Lord comes to earth for the second time, the Bible tells us the whole world will see that. It's described in 1 Thessalonians 5. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Hmm. But as believers, as we wait to meet Jesus and see our loved ones, live for God. Live for God. Of all the passages on the second coming, I think this quite possibly might perk our attention more than any. 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12. Since all these things are dissolved in this way, the earth, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day and hasten its coming. See, the sting of death is real. Sting of death is real. But Jesus will return and he will take and replace that sting with joy. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. 
We know that when He appears, we will all be like Him. Because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies Him just as He is pure. Our service began with a man singing about the coming of the Lord. And the, the refrain from that song is this. When Jesus steps out on the cloud and calls His children, the dead in Christ will rise to meet Him in the air. And those of us that remain will be changed in a moment at the midnight cry. At the midnight cry. When we are gathered home. What a joyous thought. Amen. Let's pray.